Hi there, welcome to lecture nine. So in lecture nine, we are going to talk about we are going to talk about geographic data quality assessment. Now this is this is one of the topics or this is one of the subject that comes under the metadata. Uh, I'm going to treat it a little bit semi-independent because it is important that we understand data quality assessment. And at the same time, it's also important to understand how and where it fits in the metadata. So I'm going to blend it just a bit. But when we talk about data quality, we are actually talking about the degree of relevance a data is for the purpose it's being used for. Now remember, this definition basically means that we do not have a perfect data. A data is perfect based on what the purpose it was it was created for and so the data quality issues can span from many sources it could be from right away from the onset the time of the data capture or the data creation it could also be from the kind of data formats or the the data format chosen to the data format whoever created the data chose to keep the data in because each of them have their limitations and um, advantages and then it could also come from the transfer of data from one uh, software to another or from one uh, application to another. These are all sources of data quality or sources of errors we are going to get that brings about the concerns of data quality. Now, there are elements we call indicators and these indicators are used to assess the quality of of the data remember they are called indicators so they are not a black and white stamp that says this data is quality this data is not quality and it becomes a standardized standardized uh, declaration rather they give us an indication of whether we should we should doubt the the quality of of the data or, or not so it, it only prompts you to look at the data again and it helps you to uh, see how you can measure the exact dis discrepancies in, in the data. Okay, so we are going to go through them. When we talk about the data quality, there are two main dimensions I want to go into. The first one is the self supervised created data. This is my own term, so it's not something you will find in the GIS book. But the second one, which is the crowdsource mapped or VGI data, that you can find them. So self-supervised created data is a data which, like, if you work in a company where you have employed enumerators to go and collect data on the field, you have trained them, you have given them devices where you have trained them, you have told them and, and explained to them exactly what you want them to capture. Now, in this kind of uh, process, you have provided some sort of quality check during the training before this, they are sent to the field. And you constantly provide monitoring alongside even in the data process, data collection process. In the crowdsource mapping is when many people or VGI data collection is when there are so many volunteers collecting data for different reasons. Some are donating data for their own reasons, which is always not so clear to, to us as GIS people because we do not know why they, they created the data. And they, there is no metadata framework for them to provide us the reasons and the purpose why this data was, was sent. And so we have some element in collecting the GIS data or some element in that we use to assess the quality of GIS data. And by elements we we mean things we look out for when we when we want to assess the quality of the data. And it includes completeness, logical consistency, spatial accuracy, thematic accuracy, temporal quality, and then data usability. Now, those elements that we've just spoken about are indicators and they give us impressions 
or the impressions that we derive from these elements we've just spoken about are what help us to get the data quality indicators. So indicator is something that gives you a signal, it gives you a sign. So out of these elements we just spoke about, we can get positional accuracy, attribute accuracy, completeness, logical consistency, lineage, temporal information. We're going to go through this one by one to have a good idea about what they mean. So positional accuracy. When we talk about positional accuracy, we are just interested in how close were the features that were how close were the mapped features to the original location in the real world. And so we we are just interested in uh, the level of uh, closeness we were able to get to. So if you bring if you collect data and you plot it on on your GIS software on a map and the data is three meters or five meters away from the actual location it's supposed to be, then we can have uh, a deviation of let's say five meters. And this is looking at the positional accuracy. Now the sources of positional accuracy are many. It could come from the fact that the, the time of data creation itself, there was an issue during the time of data creation. It could come as a result of the transformations because these are mathematical formulas and they all have their limitations. But during the transformation, in case the data was, let's say, created out of a paper or a manual paper into a digital format, then the georeferencing process would, would, would also provide some sort of um, error within the data. And mostly we try to use the root mean square error with RMS error in short. Root mean square error to try to assess to what extent is the georeference inaccurate. And then errors can also be associated with processing. Different algorithms do a lot of stuff to the data behind the scenes and this may not uh, bring out the data the same way it was actually received within the software. Now, when we talk about position accuracy, we are talking about two major things. We are talking about precision, and we are talking about accurate. Now, a data can be accurate, but not precise. A data can be precise and not accurate, and, and vice versa. So the combinations are what we have here on the left side. So F, Imagine that you have received, you have sent a form which collects the location of, of the, the place where the form was filled. And you are asking people what, what they find in their location. Now, if you get multiple people giving you the same response and their location is actually coming from almost the same place, then you get to know, yes, this place is likely to be what they said it is because there are different independent people who have not connived to give any particular response, but their responses are clustering towards a particular point. So now this data is precise because it, it is what it says it is, and it is accurate because it is they are all almost found at the same, close to their, their location. So the target is the intersection of these uh, two, two cross -eyed. You can also have a data which is not precise, but it's accurate. So this data is collected and you see that they are all somewhere around the central point, but it is not definite. You can't, they, they, they seem to be a bit dispersed from the, the central point. So we say that this is accurate because we see where the, the target it's supposed to be, but it is not precise because it is not, I think the word precise should be, should be um, explanatory enough. And then we can have data set which is precise and it is not accurate. So we see that the center point is here. This All this data is actually collecting outside the central points. They look very precise because they look like, oh, this is what they, they are actually looking for. Or this is, um, we know where exactly the, the data is, is pointing at but we also see the target we are looking at. 
So on, by target, they are not close to the target, so it is not accurate, but they seem to be precise because they are all clustered around the same uh, area. And then we can have a data set which is neither of them. So it is neither precise nor accurate. So like something like this, we have no idea where uh, the actual target should be because this is not precise and it is also not accurate as well. So for positional accuracy, this is what we, we look out for. It's, uh, for practical sake, this looks like it really works for point data, but it works for line data as well. It works for uh, polygon data as well. You will need some little bit of exploration to be able to to gather some of the ways how these things work in, in real sense. <laughs> the next one is attribute accuracy. In attribute accuracy, we are interested in the information you have provided about the location you have given. How accurate, how true is the information you have provided in the accurate, in the attribute? So for instance, if you say that a particular label or if you label a particular field as having a particular name. So for instance, there's a coordinate X and a latitude and a longitude here. And it says that this is the fish river near Fort K. So imagine that this is this location is plotted. Will it be at the fish river near Fort K? If not, then this attribute wise it is not it is not it is not true. So we it loses the accuracy in the attribute. It could also be that you said that the a drainage area is 2,252.7 kilometers square. In real sense, if we measure, will it be that figure? And so that's the kind of investigation we are looking at. We are looking at how true is the information about the representation. And so that's what we, we are looking at for attributes information. If you say 40% of the, the crown cover value of a tree stands at 40%, well, if you provide 40% in the attributes as the crown cover of the tree, in real sense, that's it. Is it really 40%? And how far away it is? Is it like 40.1 or 39.8? It could those things will tell us so it tells us the degree or how far it moves away from or the magnitude of deviation logical consistency now logical consistency is combining logic and consistency and what what we mean is that to what extent is the the data being mapped to what extent does the data actually correspond to the way in real life things are and to what extent is the data you are seeing able to model the relationship between in the real world remember when we in our previous lectures i think lecture two when we talked about lecture three or four we talked about gis data model and we talked about the models that's how we capture gis data so the whole idea behind everything is that we are trying to <clears throat> we are trying to capture real world into a computer and manipulate to get answers or ask questions, get answers to our questions. So for instance, you have a building and you have um, these features in real world. We do not find roads over buildings or roads crossing over features like this then it becomes a problem. For instance, we also have this road, which is also crossing over a feature, which in the real world, we know that it cannot happen. Logically, it doesn't make sense. And then we also have this where you see that the road has, has this demarcated lane and the features also have their own demarcated lane, which this makes sense to us because in real world, this is how things look like and not this way. And so when data comes, these are some of the things that we look at. So logical consistency, we are investigating things like this around the data to see, is it logical? If you find informations and they are not logical, you would be able to, to tell. 
Now, data completeness. The data completeness is basically looking at how much of what is mapped. So there are, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight features here, eight buildings here. However, only two of them are actually mapped. Do we say that the data is complete? Now, by this, by just taking a look at it, we'd say that the data collection is incomplete. However, let's be mindful. Completeness is subject to the purpose for which the data is being collected. So imagine that this project or the purpose for which this data is being collected is basically to look at school buildings. And these buildings are the only school buildings here, but the rest of them are actually residential buildings. If that's the case, then we say that the data is complete. And this is the reason why this data quality information has to be in the metadata because we would judge the, the purpose for which the data was collected against the data that we see. And so this data, for instance, would be data on school, uh, government schools or school properties. And we see other buildings that we don't automatically say the data is incomplete because there are other buildings that are not being mapped because they do not, they might not fit for the purpose the data was being collected for. And so in metadata, you provide this data quality information. And these data quality information are what we, we base on to actually understand the context within the data and guide the judgment of whoever is, is, is judging the data. Now, lineage. Lineage is, is, is simple in our real life, so I'm going to try and make this demonstration to you. William and Jessica gave birth to Samantha, they gave birth to Soleil, Soleil and then they gave birth to Ryan. Samantha <clears throat> married Maya, and they, they both had James and Yoko. And then James and Yoko decided to have uh, a summer cat, a cat called Summer. Now, uh, Solio married Richard. Richard and Solio gave birth to Charles and April. And Charles and April later also gave birth to uh, Geraldine. Then Ryan and uh, Maga uh, married, and then they also gave birth to Gerald and Andrea, and then Gerald and Andrea. They also gave birth to Andrea. Andrea married Gerald, and then Gerald gave birth to Nia. Now, if we see Nia, we can trace Nia all the way back to us, to William and Jessica, because we know their lineage, where they come from. Data has that kind of information. So geospatial data has this kind of information. When you collect data from a colleague who was not the original creator of the data, where did he get the data from? What has he done to the data since he collected it? What was the, what was the state of the data at the time he collected it? Probably the person he also took the data from also took it from someone. We need to be able to understand the processes that had occurred on the data because that gives us an indication. Remember, we've said some of the sources of the data quality comes from transformations. So that gives us an indication of the possible quality issues we are, we are likely to look out for. Luckily for us, some of the softwares inherently collect these information. So it, it keeps the history of processes that has been done on them. So if you are using some of the desktop applications like uh, ArcGIS, they, they keep this information inherently within the data because it tries to create a very sim simple uh, metadata for every data. So we, we would be able to have some information about it, even if the original person or if people have not been recording it. But I don't know, it might not be for every software. It is a good practice to provide information like this. When you get the data, go back to the metadata and add to it what you also have done to the data. And that way we can be able to get the information that we need. I hope that metadata quality or data quality, geographic data quality has become 
more valuable to you now and i hope that you will take it more seriously you have also gotten an idea about how to assess data quality in our next lecture we will talk about assessing data quality for volunteer geographic data and i separated this because they they are quite two different uh, things and i feel they have different dimensions that we will need to to look at and so until then i'll see you and we'll talk about vgi data quality